Uh, my name is John Horgan. I'm a science journalist and a longtime correspondent for Blogging Heads TV. And uh, I have a really great guest today. Um, it's Michael Schellenberger, who is a, uh, I think it's fair to say, kind of a, a troublemaking, iconoclastic environmental activist for a long time. We've, we've known each other since... I think maybe 2006, I, I read your book, the book that you co-wrote with um, your longtime collaborator, Ted Nordhaus. Uh, it, it was called Breakthrough, right? Yep. And um, it was recommended to me by an old friend of mine, uh, the environmental journalist, yeah. Andy Ravkin, who spoke of it very highly. I had just started Steve teaching at Stevens Institute I wanted to have lectures um, that had a little oomph to them. I cre created this thing called the Green Book Award and uh, to give attention to books that I thought were saying some really interesting things about, um, about all our environmental issues. The first year after I created the, the award, I gave it to E.O. Wilson, you know, the, the great uh, uh, biologist and environmental activist. Second yep. year was you and Ted for your book, uh, Breakthrough. Breakthrough. And I, I, yep. brought you, I brought you to Stevens to talk about it, and um, we really get along. And, and I, I'm going to let you talk very soon, but I yeah. just wanted to tell, tell you what, and tell the audience what attracted me to your set of ideas. You were, you were really challenging some of the core tenets of conventional um, environmentalism, one was uh, that we don't need to be so pessimistic about overcoming our problems. So you had this kind of can-do, optimistic spirit, which appealed to me. Um, another was that science and technology, in, instead of being part of the problem, which a lot of environmental, environmental, a lot of environmentalists had said going back to the 60s and maybe even earlier, should be seen as part of the uh, solution. You also said something that, I found counterintuitive at first, but then it really made sense to me, which was that um, economic prosperity, well-being, um, are really essential to people giving a shit about the environment. That right. uh, poor people don't have the luxury of caring about taking care of biodiversity or even thinking that a lot about uh, pollution and some other concerns, unless it absolutely affects them directly. So uh, these are some of the things that you talked about. Is that, is that a fair assessment, first of all, of your, um, of your book and your original critique of environmentalism? Yeah, you got it. You got it just right, John. You all nailed right. it, dude. Well, now you've got, and we've sort of stayed in touch over the years. You created this think tank, the uh, Breakthrough Institute, and you had these wonderful conferences out in San Francisco. And I went to, I think, two of them. And I had a great time. Lots of, um, lots of creative thinking about uh, the environment, but with this overall context, I'd say, of optimism, can-do spirit, science and technology are part of the solution, not, not part of the problem. So now you've got this new book out that's causing, it's already really caused uh, a stir, uh, Apocalypse Never. And I wonder if you could just sort of uh, lay out some of the basic themes of your book, and then we'll talk about the specifics. Yeah, sure. So thanks, John. That's exactly right. Um, I see this, I see Apocalypse Never, um, which I've held hardcover as best because it comes with the eight page color photo insert, always a childhood dream to have a eight page color insert in a hardcover. So the book's really uh, three different parts. The first part is a debunking of popular environmental myths. The second part is how humans actually save nature in the real world. And then the third part is asking this question of why, if environmental problems are serious, but not the end of the world, did we come to see them as apocalyptic? And so the first part, just sort of go, you know, the, the quick version is climate change is real. Um, we need to deal with it, but it's not the end of the world, and it's not even our most serious environmental problem. 
the Amazon is not the lungs of the world, nor a source of oxygen. And the efforts to save the Amazon have uh, mostly backfired because they've encouraged fragmentation of the forest as a result of both a kind of neo-colonial attitude and also by a kind of small is beautiful ideology. And then the and then I have an, a chapter on plastic waste. Plastic waste is a problem in the ocean, but it's also the case that it's breaking down. You know, we we mostly breaks down, which is great news. And there's much bigger threats to sea life. And that if we want to deal with plastic waste, and you'll detect a theme here, we uh, poor countries need to develop economically, since most of the plastic waste comes from poor countries that don't have waste management systems. And then the and then I look at species extinction. Um, it's true we've lost half of all wild animals in the world due to a loss of habitat, but we're not causing a sixth mass extinction. E.O. Wilson got that wrong and has never properly corrected it, by the way. And that that apocalyptic framing is really counterproductive and has been contributing to a kind of neo-colonial Malthusianism. That's a word that derives from the thinking of a 18th century economist named Thomas Malthus, who thought that humans were doomed to having periodic famines because we'd overpopulate the world. And then the second part looks at really the keys to protecting the natural environment are the processes of urbanization, people moving out of the countryside into the city, usually getting jobs in factories or uh, you know other city jobs. That allows for, means that there's fewer farmers, but they have to intensify production. They have to grow more food on less land. That allows former farms to return to nature, grasslands and forests usually. And then, uh, and then I argue that there's an energy hierarchy. You go from wood and dung to coal to natural gas to uranium, that's benevolent transition. Nuclear being a, a, a technology I think we're gonna talk a lot about, I hope we do. Um, and, and then I also argue that renewables are necessarily worse for the environment because the fuels, sunlight, wood, water, wind, are dilute, and so you have to you have to spread renewables technologies over large areas of land in order to capture sufficient energy flows to produce electricity. And then the third part of the book finds that there's so why is everybody so crazy and apocalyptic about these manageable problems, serious but problems that we know how to solve? It's not super hard actually; it's pretty straightforward. And I look at money, particularly the influence of the renewable energy industry, along with natural gas interests. I look at power, which is the, the drive both for status, but also global power, global elites keeping down poor countries, insisting that they stay small farming communities. And then the last chapter, I argue that this apocalyptic environmentalism is really a religious movement, that it's, it's, it's language, it's symbolism, it's archetypes, the structure, the, the motivations, the needs are clearly coming from a need to feel some, some grander sense of purpose and even a sense of immortality. And these things all get kind of woven together, particularly with nuclear, which I think threatens or has threatened human existence in ways that few other things have and stirred these existential anxieties, but not uniformly, but particularly with secular people. And I think that nuclear became a kind of devil for the left, for the secular left that no longer believed in traditional religion and that the new God became nature. So that's the crazy argument in a nutshell for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, that's I, the whole thing. A lot to unpack there. Plenty to unpack for you. Yeah. I, so I read your book in galleys. Jesus, uh, must be at least two months ago. And um, I found it. Uh, well, let me give a little context. You blurbed it for me, so you I must have liked it enough that you thought it should be published. Yes, definitely. So I, I, my reaction to um, climate change and environmental issues generally is, um, is quite emotional, I've got to say. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, you know, I read the, the I, I, I try to keep abreast of what's happening empirically, uh, but... Um, I'm, I struggle, I, I sort of find myself veering between pessimism and optimism. So mm -hmm. uh, last fall, I think it was, I read The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells, which scared the shit out of me, actually. Yeah. And I wrote a very uh, positive review of it. 
for Scientific American. I also read all of Bill McKibben's essays in uh, the New York Review of Books. Um, And, um, you know, the New Yorker has had, I would say, pretty scary coverage of uh, climate change and related issues. Um, And so, and those, those make me feel anxious and really worried. You know, I've got two children in their twenties. I worry about the future for them. Um, And then, and then Wallace Wells, I thought made a pretty good case that things are really bad. Um, And so I, uh, I'm actually desperate. I think I'm inclined toward optimism naturally. And so I, which is one of the reasons why I, I, I liked the critique of environmentalism from you and Ted in the first place. It's very optimistic. But then, but last fall, I was feeling pretty glum. Obviously, you know, then we've got, uh, you know, we've also got Donald Trump. We've got uh, the, the pandemic. Then your book came and it was just what I needed. It was like, oh, good. So optimistic. Um, and uh, so the blurb that I wrote was uh, that this was a good corrective to some of the alarmism um, that some activists and journalists, including myself, have, uh, have succumbed to recently. Now, your book has come out, and I've been, um, I've been reading some of the coverage. You've gotten some, you've gotten some good reviews, but you've also gotten some really serious blowback from some people that I thought were allies of yours. So, uh, for example, just this morning, I read a pretty critical review by Alex um, Trembeth, you know, your, your former, I hope I've pronounced his name correctly, your former uh, colleague at the Breakthrough Institute. Um, there's another guy at the Breakthrough Institute uh, who also has been criticizing some of the, uh, the content of your book. Um, and then some, some people, some other people who wrote reviews for your, uh, wrote uh, blurbs for your book, like Tom Wigley, have also expressed concern over the way that you're promoting your book. I, I think the issue is some of your critics think that you are, you've gone into a polarized debate and you might be making it even more polarized. So I want to start with this kind of meta issue at first. Are you, is there anything you regret as far as the rhetoric in your book or in the way that you've talked about it since its publication um, that you, you would like take back now? Well, let's start with the, with the environment. So we are definitely, it's an election year. It's a polarized environment. Um, you know, my book is a national bestseller. It was on every bestselling on every, every list of bestsellers, except for the New York times which kept it off, even though I sold more copies than other books that were put on the New York Times bestseller list. They've, ref- they've refused to review it. They've refused to publish my op-ed. Um, even though I mean, they, I, published you, they published you in the yeah, back. A bunch yeah. Of yeah. I mean, I know a lot of people there. We both know people there. And, and, and so let's just say that the reason is clearly ideological. Um, so that's the environment it's, it's, it's gone into. Um, I, I had to announce the book. I had to summarize it. And in the most controversial sentence, let's just deal with the most controversial thing up front, was I said, climate change is not making natural disasters worse. I don't, I don't think that's controversial, but that was very controversial. Here's what people said in response. They said, or let me, like, let me explain what that means. Um, climate change is not making natural disasters worse. Because natural disasters are getting better. So deaths from natural disasters have declined 90% over the last 100 years. While the human population quadrupled, they've declined 80 to 90% over the last 40 years. 90, over 90% decline in Bangladesh because of, of weather forecasting and storm shelters. Nobody should die of cyclones anymore. Nobody should die of hurricanes anymore. Floods, those are the two big ones. Um, there, it appears as though 2020... To date, the first half of 2020 has had fewer deaths from natural disasters than at any other point in recorded history. So let's just pause for a minute and pat ourselves on the back as a species for taking care of each other so that nobody gets killed by natural disasters. I mean, we're down to like under a half a million deaths a year. I mean, it's great. Um, 
deaths from infectious diseases, deaths from, you know, down, going down, 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 right? Life expectancy going up. So that's the trend. So then, so here's what my critics are doing that I, I find dishonest. And I'm not going to name names, actually, but I do find this dishonest. They say, Michael's wrong about natural disasters because we can see that climate change is making some extreme weather events more severe. Well, do you saw what they just did there? They just switched from natural disasters to extreme weather events. What's the difference? To many people, it sounds like the same thing. It's not. A hurricane is an extreme weather event. A disaster is specifically by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to which I am an invited expert reviewer. And in every dictionary in the world, a disaster is measured by deaths and property damage. Full stop. If a hurricane doesn't touch ground, doesn't hurt anybody, it's not a disaster, okay? So, so I, I think that the criticism of that sentence is wrong. Okay, then you get some people, they say, well, Michael, okay, come on. Um, we can show that some extreme weather events are worse, faster wind speeds and hurricanes, longer fire season for fires, uh, more heat waves. I agree with all that. That's all in my book. I accept all of the IPCC science of climate change. So that doesn't increase disasters. They say, well, but we might have reduce disasters even more had there not been climate change. Okay, there's two problems with that. First, it's a hypothesis, <laughs> which is not science. Hypothesis is part of science, but that's not, you know, counterfactual hypotheses. They're interesting, but they're not science. Okay, that's just speculation. The second thing is that's if all else being equal. Well, all else isn't equal. Like we use energy I mean, global warming, climate change is a result of energy consumption. So we use all that energy to make the storm shelters, the infrastructure, the highways, the electrical grids, the, the flood management systems that protect us from natural disasters. So you can't sit there and say, oh, well, we would be better off without all this global warming. Well, no, if it meant that we were living like small farmers in Africa, we'd be worse off. So, so that's the first big issue. Um, the second issue, the, the, everything else is much easier, actually. The, uh, the sixth great extinction. Humans are not causing a sixth mass extinction. Full stop. We're just not. Like, Mike, um, can I, and, yeah. yeah. I just want to pause. Stay with disasters. Yeah, yeah. And go back to the sixth ma mass extinction in a second. Yeah. I just want to, I actually want to agree with, with I, I think what you're saying about natural disasters is that we've, We've shown a remarkable ability to adapt to weather and climate changes in, in ways that save lives and, and, um, and our you know, economic systems and all that. And I have had a problem with some environmentalists for not even acknowledging some of the progress that we've made, both in, um, I don't know, cleaning up the air and the water. Right. And also, as you say, adapting to some of the things right. that, that might be happening as a result of climate change. It seems to me that if you keep denying that we've made any progress at all, or you minimize the progress, right. it under, undercuts your motivation to try to do things in the future. So again, I'm going back to sort of psychology. So I, I, yeah. you know, I, I actually, I, I think that this is, this is a good point of yours. It just seems that some of your critics and again these are people i think that are friendly to you and and um think that they're not the points that, well i i mean like carrie emmanuel i think um wrote a blurb for your book or he, he has said nice things about your book but then he sort of rolled it back a little bit in some of his online uh comments about this natural disaster issue so it seems like we're getting to it's a it's a question of style and tone as well as I, content I mean, I don't want to, I, I think there's other motivations behind some of this. I don't want to get into it, but I don't think it has to do with the content. I don't think it has to do with what I wrote. Um, but if we're focused on the content on what I wrote, what I wrote is accurate. Now, there's, there's some people, again, I don't want to get into specifics, who have said what I should have said was not climate change is not making natural disasters worse. What I should have said was, Climate change is not making disasters worse. As far as we know, sure, because you can't prove a negative. Okay, this is an old philosophical point. We can't prove there's no God, John. Um, but if you like, if you're the president of the United States, and 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 there's 
one out of five adolescents, uh, one out of five British adolescents, by the way, are having nightmares of climate change right now. That's the latest research from, from, let's say one out of five American children were having nightmares that aliens are invading Earth. And there's a press conference and they say to the president, they go, sir, are aliens invading Earth? And if the president says, well, we can't be sure that the aliens aren't invading Earth. We don't think so. We don't think so now. No, the, this is, the president goes, aliens are not invading Earth. And then the journalist says, I don't know. We've had these Navy pilots who have seen the, and you, and the Pentagon has released these videos of these strange craft. So how can you know that the aliens aren't invading Earth? And the president says, because they're not invading Earth. We, 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 we have no evidence that the aliens are invading Earth. Same thing. I don't think anybody would say, oh, you should have, you know, caveated that more. No, you just, I've got a 14-year-old daughter. She's fine. But her friends are not sure that they're going to live long enough to have kids because of climate change. We are in a situation of mass hysteria. In that situation, I don't think it's responsible to go, well, I don't know. I mean, it could be. And there is, I can't, I, here, here's the punchline. What is the scenario where the death, the declining death toll, the 90% decline in death toll of natural disasters reverses itself from climate change? Nobody has offered that scenario. There is no scenario. IPCC doesn't offer a scenario. Um, maybe David Wallace Wells does, who basically took media coverage, already alarmist media coverage, and then wrote this alarmist book. It's frankly, it's irresponsible. Um, there is no reason, John, that anybody should die from climate change in the future. Nobody should. Deaths from disease, infectious disease, which is the one that we look at with climate change, and disasters should keep going down. It should. If it doesn't, then we're doing something wrong in terms of our adaptation. The bigger issue is this all comes out of a, of a, of a frankly pretty terrible Malthusian ideology, which suggests that all of this civilization, it's all resting on a house of cards. It's like a Jenga puzzle. One more species goes extinct. The whole thing's going to fall apart. There's no science to any of that. Um, and the real environmental problems, the real environmental problems, which I document at great length in the book, are precisely because humans are so good at adapting to every freaking environment, man. We can suck food out of every single niche environment. We can get food, we can, you know, we're over, we're depleting the, the, the oceans of food. You know, we're spreading our cows everywhere. Now that's starting to decline, which is good news. But this whole, this whole apocalyptic idea that something is going to happen in the future that's going to result in some reversal of these trends, there's no mechanism. Like, what's the mechanism where somehow the flood control systems, which we take for granted and don't even see, but which we depend on, the electrical grids, the roads, What's the situation where they disappear? It's a nuclear war. That's the situation. That's the only model is that there's a nuclear war that destroys our, our civilization. There's no similar scenario for climate change. And you have to just say that because otherwise the kids, the adolescents, they're, 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 they're having anxiety issues around this. They're getting OCD, you know? Well, now, so, here, so I think you have to say it clearly. Well, here, here's, so... Mike, I hope you're right. Uh, here's here's the the scenario that that scares me. It would be um, I don't know primarily in in countries that are less well developed. You've got rising sea levels, uh, which um, might create uh, unlivable circumstances in certain parts of the world where there is uh, where there there are large populations. Uh, you might that might be combined with uh, with droughts. You get you know you've got the reduction of uh, of the ice cap and the Himalayas and other mountain ranges. So you've got disruption of of water supplies for agriculture and so forth. The scenario that that I've seen that seems somewhat plausible to me is that these kinds of factors could cause mass migration, which will uh, disrupt societies around the world, both poor societies and eventually uh, wealthier ones as well. Um, but let me, uh, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily looking to your reaction to that. Yeah. What, what, again, I keep going to these sort of meta issues. 
there are there are some people i don't know if they can be called climate change deniers but you know some certainly some of the skeptics have been delighted by your book and by some of the things that you're you're writing um does that concern you is, is there any uh i mean are you saying that that no anxiety concern over climate change is actually warranted i mean what's the separation between you and just flat out climate change deniers well climate change deniers are people that deny that the climate's changing or that humans are causing it that humans are or causing. that there's or that there's no risk i mean look i'm i mean first of all i am a climate activist i've been a climate activist for 20 years i've i my work saving nuclear power plants from closing working with james hansen and tom wigley and carrie manuel and all these climate scientists We've prevented the equivalent of carbon emissions rising, the equivalent of 24 million cars to the roads. We've had a big impact. Um, I do think it's a serious concern. I have other reasons that nuclear is important, uh, just regular air pollution and land use issues and the fact that it's you know, a dual use technology. It's a very dangerous technology and we have to be really, really good stewards of it. Um, you know, people, people, you know, I went on, like, so like literally like the book comes out, um, and 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 people want to have me on their show. Well, I didn't get phone calls from Rachel Maddow and Chris Hayes. I would have loved to have gone on Rachel Maddow and Chris Hayes. My mom is always like, go on Rachel Maddow. Mom, I would love to go on Rachel Maddow, right? So then they go, so then Fox News invites me on. Okay, like if I don't do Fox News, then I don't get in the media. And that's what people really want. That's what they're really saying. Schellenberger shouldn't get any attention for his ideas. My, one of my friends from college is like, you can't go on Tucker Carlson because he's a racist and whatever. Would you would you sit down and have an interview with Adolf Hitler, Michael? And I'm kind of like, I don't know. Could I ask him about the Holocaust? I mean, it's like, what you know, um, Adolf Hitler had a talk show. I mean, so, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, and are we really like at the point now where we're just like, like, like liberals? I'm a Democrat. I'm a, I consider myself a progressive. I want single payer health care. I want gun control, right? All this stuff. I don't talk to, so I'm not supposed to talk to conservatives anymore. Is that where we're at? Like, we just decide that we're just not going to talk to each other. Um, you're helping global warming. What does that even mean? Like, I go on to, like, if I go on, talk to climate deniers, and they go, now, Michael, don't you deny? No, I go, no, I don't. I agree with IPCC. So, so frankly, I'll tell you what the actual, the actual effect has been, um, is that people kind of go, I find a bunch of my conservative friends, they go, they go, yeah, I've always agreed that climate change was real, <laughs> you know, and you know, and it's kind of like, sure, you know, they, you were talking about sunspots a couple of months ago, but, you know, now you, fine, like, who cares? Um, let's just be grownups for a minute. Like, this is not eighth grade lunchroom, you know, where it's like, who am I going to sit with? Am I going to sit with the cool liberal kids or am I going to have to sit with the... Um, but let's talk about the issue of, of kind of what, how to think about the risks, right? So, so I cite, you know, on page eight, you know, the issue of kind of displacement. So the first thing is when you read the IPCC, which is what I rely on, um, they say the best science says climate change has affected organized armed conflict within countries that can find it. However, other drivers, such as low socioeconomic development and low capabilities of the state, meaning terrible governments, are substantially more influential. So the point is like, the Congo, which is where I go in the book, right? The first chapter, it's like, like they don't have a flood management system. They don't have roads. They don't have modern agriculture. They don't have peace. They don't have security. Bernadette, who's the main, one of the main figures in the book and is a small farmer in Congo. Like she's, what is she supposed to be worried about climate change? Like she's worried about being kidnapped and raped. And then she's worried because then her house is flooded every year. Um, so it's a way to kind of go, just hold on a second. And the major factors that determine how well we, do, we will deal with, say, two to three inches of more precipitation a year, which is what the estimates are for flooding, or, or more heat waves, determine what we do. One of my favorite examples is everybody talked in 2003, the Paris heat waves that killed a bunch of people in Paris, right? Mostly elderly people without air conditioning. Well... So, you know, this picture of humans as these helpless, as these helpless victims. Well, by the time you get to 20, 2006, fewer people died in the Paris heat waves than their models anticipated because they were all prepared for it. They made sure that the elderly 
you know, we're getting an air conditioning and they were all in advance, you know, same thing with sea level rise. I mean, part of me goes, come on, dude, like you've been to the Netherlands. There's parts of the Netherlands that are seven meters below sea level. They far, you know, median estimate sea level rise for IPCC is 0.6 meters between now and the end of the century. It's slow moving. Um, you know, so like we think the Bangladesh, we think we're going to be on the, the, on the, you know, they're just gonna be like, oh my God, no, sea level rise over like a 60 year period. I mean, um, you know, and then some people will go, well, some coastal areas, Michael, are going to be uninhabitable. And I'm kind of, as an environmentalist, I'm like, great. So you're saying that we're going to have less coastal development, more habitat for imperiled sea life? Sounds good to me. You're saying that the small farmers that are on the coast of Bangladesh are going to have to go to the cities? Sounds good to me. When I interview small farmers, including ones that go to the city to get jobs in cities, which is a big part of the theme of the book, chapter five. They're not like, oh my gosh, I want to go back and be a small farmer. They're like, I'm glad I'm in the city. I don't, I can marry who I want to marry and I can make money and be a liberated woman and not be under the thumb of my dad or my husband or something. So this picture, you know, I think people paint of just kind of, we're just these helpless victims of changes to weather events. It's just absurd. Um, let me ask, and we need to push back against it. Let me ask, uh, so there, there's been, I remember going back, I don't know, 25 or 30 years, I, I had some sort of grouchy older scientists. Uh, there was a guy named Gunther Stent, I think was one of the first people who said this to me, a biologist at uh, Berkeley. He sounds grumpy. Pardon me? Sounds grumpy, Gunther. Yeah, yeah. Um, old yeah. German guy. Um, and uh, he was talking <laughs> about the environmental movement, and he said those environmentalists, are anti-human. They want to save uh, nature, but they don't care about people. Yeah. Um, is that, do you think, is that kind of what you're saying? Do you think that that some environmentalists are, uh, are against the kind of economic development uh, in, the, in the name of saving nature that's absolutely necessary for pe pulling people out of poverty? Um, is that, do you still think that that sort of contrast between- Absolutely. I mean, so, you know, chapter, yeah. yeah. So I have a whole chapter, chapter 11, which looks at how what we call environmentalism is really an ideological movement whose main figure is Thomas Malthus, who is this 18th century guy who at a moment when Condorcet and Godwin and these enlightenment figures were coming out writing books saying, Hey, you know, with with pro with technological progress, with science and technology, there's no reason that humans can't be lifted out of poverty. All humans can't be li lifted out of poverty. Um, there's no reason that we can't extend lives. Uh, we can even control how many kids we have. They did have condoms back then, by the way. Um, Malthus was enraged by this idea, enraged by the idea of everybody gets to enjoy prosperity. He sat down, determined to show that that wasn't true, and he came up with this just ridiculous idea that somehow we would have more kids than there would be food for. It was immediately refuted by, by Godwin himself, who said, we're just going to have fewer kids. We'll choose to have fewer kids, first of all. Second of all, we'll grow more food on less land. They already were doing that in Britain, by the way. And Malthus would make up these reasons the big one was it would be immoral to use birth control. Okay, but that's not like some physical law. Well, you fast forward after World War II, we have two big Malthusian thinkers in the United States that promote this idea. It gets picked up over the next 20 years. The most famous environmentalist, Malthusian thinker is Paul Ehrlich, who said, you know, we're all going to die. Billions are going to die. There's too many people. Well, we knew already that the birth rate, the, the, the growth of birth rate had peaked in the, in the late 60s. The overall growth rate had peaked in the late 80s. And it was at that moment, I think there's two things. It was clear that population would peak and decline. And the Cold War ended. So the fears of nuclear war went away. And that's when climate change became the new apocalyptic issue and the vehicle for basically trying to deprive countries cheap energy and modern agriculture. So is it, you sort of say, is it happening? Just look at what the World Bank funds. The World Bank used to fund flood control, hydroelectric dams, roads, 
irrigation, fertilizer, the things that allow for us to live in these beautiful homes and have electricity and buildings and modern life. It's the thing that separates us from the Congo. Now the World Bank doesn't fund that anymore. They fund democracy workshops and empowerment workshops and solar panels and batteries for people to use in their village in the countryside. But not hydroelectric dams, heaven forbid, not coal plants, not natural gas plants, because all of that would just be terrible, right? All those poor people getting all this prosperity. So Malthusianism is now the official policy of the World Bank. You know, it's the official policy of the Democratic Party and of center left parties around the world. Um, it's terrible. Um, now, is it anti-human? It's a very interesting question. Um, I don't think that the people who are implementing those policies are against themselves or against their families. I don't think they're suicidal. I think they're on a power trip. You know, I think they want to deprive power and prosperity to others. That's why I named the chapter The Denial of Power. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's, what I get to at the end, and I'm very gentle about it, actually, and I actually turn back on my own views of how what I was thinking when I was an apocalyptic environmentalist. And I also use Dick Rhodes, who wrote is a famous historian of nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. I what I what I argue is that there's a if for people that are feeling socially isolated, socially insecure, variety of reasons, want to feel better about themselves, go out and talk about the end of the world, whether it's from Y2K or in the Mayan apocalypse or whatever. And they feel sort of, you know, powerful because it's fun. You know, you scare people. It's a get a kind of a rush from it, including scaring children. Um, and that they have a kind of fantasy that, yeah, all of this civilization will be swept away and we'll have to go back to some other earlier time. I mean, it shows up in all the books and, and movies. And, and so I think it's a kind of anti-civilization fantasy. Um, now, it's weird because, of course... It's always paired with, I mean, here you have the same people, this, the same person who says um, civilization is terrible because it's alienating us from each other and it's alienating us from nature. And we use nature as, uh, we treat nature as dead as opposed to alive and we're destroying the earth and blah, blah, blah. Civilization is terrible. And then they say, here, do what I propose to save civilization. Well, why do you want to save civilization? You just said that it's terrible and you know, and, and in fact, everything they recommend to save civilization is actually about returning us to a period before civilization, namely using renewable energy and using organic farming. You know, and Bill McKibben says himself, such a strategy could only sustain, you know, a half a billion people or a billion people. So, you know, I've just, I, 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 I always note that the fantasy reality that it seems like environment, apocalyptic environments want to return us to is always like Elizabethan England, you know. You know, and it's like we all live in these communities and there's Renaissance fairs and, and you know, and we all, you know, and, and we're all in this kind of, but it's a kind of return to the womb. It's a kind of Rousseau vision. It's a very familiar vision, right? I mean, Marxism contained a part of it. It married a kind of productive technological side to it. But, you know, what it basically is the marriage of socialism and Malthusianism. And I was trying to figure this, this book helped me figure out to get to the bottom of it how those two things came together because Marx and Engels absolutely hated Malthus. They called him a stain on the human race because um, he was all about starving poor people. But basically those two things came together. That's what we call environmentalism. And I just don't think it has much to do at all with saving the environment. All right. Let, we've got to, uh, we've got to get to nuclear power now. Let, let me right. just say that um, I, I used to be uh, an, you know, uh, anti nuke. It, it just was part of being a, uh, kind of hippie, leftist, progressive, and right. all that. And then I changed my mind about, I forget exactly when it was, maybe nine or 10 years ago, I was writing right. about nuclear energy um, on Blogging Heads TV, actually, with my old friend, George Johnson. And, and he started telling me what an idiot I was. And then all these people wrote to me after uh, this show had aired, also telling me an idiot I was. So I educated myself and I learned that that uh, you know, nuclear power is uh, remarkably uh, safe, and compared to coal, there's absolutely uh, no you know no comparison. It's just nuclear is so much cleaner, uh, whereas coal kills I think it's hundreds of thousands of people every year because of pollution. Uh, but because I went to one of your conferences, in part, uh, there was a guy named 
me see. I wrote his name down. Um, I think he was an Austrian economist. Uh, uh, Arnold, Arnold Grubler. Yes. And he gave what I thought was a devastating critique of no. the economics of nuclear power. No. My understanding, well, let me just finish this thought. My understanding yeah. is that the major impediment to nuclear energy coming back, let's just say in the United States, is Wall Street. It's not Greens. It's that nobody wants to invest, especially when natural gas is so cheap. Nobody wants to invest in um, nuclear energy. It just costs way too much. Um, so, and, and I've got to tell you, Mike, I, I think a lot of your positions are very reasonable, but you, on the issue of nuclear power, um, you have this kind of aura of fanaticism. I'm sure you've heard that from some of your other friends. That's something that, uh, that was one of the points that Alex uh, Trembeth also said in this critique that he just posted, I guess, this, this morning. So, um, it's First of all, it's just untrue. I mean, this book literally, this book argues for, this book argues for, coal as superior to wood it argues for natural gas as superior to coal that's just a i mean honestly the people that that frame that are doing that it's part of a deliberate strategy to we're gonna frame michael as no i defend coal as better than wood it's just unfair that's the whole chapter five is about why coal is better than wood and why natural gas is better than coal my view is very simple it's very straightforward it's been out there for five years you know, coal is better than wood. Natural gas is better than than coal. Uranium is the best. But Congo and 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 Congo, they they need a hydroelectric dam. So what's this idea that I'm dogmatic about nuclear? Um, you know, it's 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 honestly it's 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 just a way to kind of try to put me down um, and to be like Michael's a dumb activist. Uh, you know, I mean, the, what about the economic critique? Okay. Of, of nuclear. So let's talk about the economics. Yeah. Okay. So first, just on the straight economics, if you're not to avoid cherry picking, you know, this solar plant is so whatever in this part of this, look at Jam Germany and France, Germany, it's electricity costs almost twice as much as French electricity. It's 10 times more carbon intensive. What's the difference? Germany's phasing out nuclear, ramping up renewables, France is mostly nuclear, it's doing a little bit of renewables. And to the extent to which France has added renewables, it's had to add natural gas, its carbon intensity has gone up. So if you care about climate change and you want to protect consumers, it's obviously the French model, well, 10 times less carbon intensive. Okay, United States. Um, here's the thing about electricity you have to understand. It's a natural monopoly, meaning we don't allow multiple electric companies to serve you. That would be mayhem because there would be all these electrical wires. Can you imagine five different electric companies with electrical wires? It would be like nightmare. So the traditional model is you either have a government run electric model, electric utility, that's what France has, or you have a private electric utility. So that's what we mostly have, by the way, about a third of our electric utilities are are public, but 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 the private ones are heavily regulated, mean, meaning that they have to get permission from the government to raise prices and traditionally to build new power plants. Um, that's fine. Um, when they want to build a nuclear power plant, you just need the public support for it. If the public doesn't support nuclear, they're not going to allow it. So the way you finance nuclear plants is you just add a small fee onto the electric on the electric bills. It provides the money now. Does Wall Street not like it? Of course, Wall Street doesn't like it because it's actually you, the way to make nuclear cheap is to use public, either public money or pension money or basically really low risk money that um, like for building a bridge or a highway or whatever, um, low, low yield money. Well, Wall Street hates that. Mostly, I mean, the pension funds are fine with it, but like the ones that want like some big returns right away are, of course, they're against it. So. So I, I just don't think this is not like an economic issue, right? I mean, when you want to build nuclear, we do it and it provides really cheap electricity. We've seen it all around the world. Okay. So then you kind of go, why aren't we doing it? Well, I document that there's this incredible relationship between natural gas companies and renewable companies working together to shut down nuclear plants. And they've been doing it since the sixties. The two biggest financers 
of, of the anti-nuclear environmental movement are guys who are heavily invested in natural gas and renewables. And they're very well-known guys, Tom Steyer and Mike Bloomberg. They both ran for president. And the media never talks about this, which is why I put them in the article. Um, so, you know, you kind of go, so, so I'm kind of like, look, I'm, I'm fine with natural gas replacing coal in the United States. I've, I've, I defended it 10 years ago. I defended fracking to my detriment. Um, I've always been in favor of natural gas replacing coal. But if we want to reduce carbon emissions for climate change or any other reasons, you got to, it's ultimately got to be nuclear. Am I fanatical about it? No, but I'll be adamant about it. I will, I, I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh yeah, there's all these, or we need some other kind of nuclear. It's just nonsense. Like the, the nuclear we have, the cheapest nuclear is the nuclear we have the most experience with. It's the nuclear we have. I mean, I, don't much, I, I can talk for a while, John, because I think the real issue here is that people are afraid of the bomb. Let's just get to it. That's what's going on. They're just placing their anxieties about the bomb onto nuclear power plants. And then a bunch of nerds come along and they go, no, I'm going to, you know, create a different kind of nuclear that's mm, better. And no, this is not like a domain for ham radio operators and enthusiasts. This is a place for big construction companies building the same kind of reactor that they know how to build over and over again. They've been doing it since the 50s. So there's just so much misinformation on this issue. Don't confuse my passion, you know, with dogmatism. Um, okay. um, like I said, I'm, I'm for an energy hierarchy. I've always been for that. All right, so I see you mentioned nuclear, and, and I'm, I'm hoping, I think we got to get into capitalism at, at, at some point. We, we don't have a ton of time, yeah. but just going. I can go, I mean, I can go 90 minutes, John. I mean, I don't know how long you have, but I'm happy okay. to go for 90 okay. minutes. We, it's a big yeah. topic, right? Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, you wrote a whole book on the end of war and phasing out nuclear weapons, right? We got we to get Yeah, that. so there, there was, I was kind of cruising along in your book, and then I reached this section at the end where you started talking about nuclear weapons and this conversation you had with, uh, you know, the great historian uh, Richard Rhodes about the place of nuclear weapons in our future. And as I recall, um, you said that, uh, that um, we're never going to get rid of nuclear weapons. This is, this is what you said in your book. And maybe right. that's a good thing. This is how I recall it, because they will be like a memento mori, a reminder of our mortality that, I guess your argument was, we'll make life more precious. Well, no, we'll make us no, no, you're compressing the article. I mean, look, let's just start with the first one. Yeah. Are we going to get rid of nuclear weapons, John? Come on. Well, we're not going to get rid of them if we think it's impossible. As well, a step toward getting rid of them, we have to assume okay. that it's, it's a practical as well as a desirable goal. All right, well, let's, let's, just, let's, just, let's, just, let's just get into that first issue, okay? Okay. Um, so I point to Benjamin Brody, 1945, Yale study group, right after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 75 years later, we are. Um, they look at this, and they have the same reaction that Niels Bohr, the great Danish physicist, has, which is that they kind of go, we're never going to get rid of these weapons. Why? Okay, let's say the United States and Soviet Union have nuclear weapons. Let's say they agree to get rid of them. First of all, you've got, an, you've got an enforcement problem because they're super easy to hide. I can hide a nuclear warhead. I can hide 10 nuclear warheads, maybe more, in my property underneath water, and they're not detectable because water is a, is a shield from the radiation. So I can hide nuclear warheads very easily. But let's say somehow we manage to get rid of nuclear weapons after 75 years of trying and failing. But let's say we do that. No more nuclear weapons for the United States and Soviet Union. What happens if the United States and Soviet Union go to war? The first thing they do is construct nuclear weapons. Now, would they use them on each other? Maybe not. Maybe they would test it. But in the heat of war, would you want to try? I mean, would you want to risk that? I wouldn't. The immediate conclusion they come to, John, was it would be better never to get rid of them. And if you read these histories, when you read the, the official histories, by the way, they're beautiful histories. They're independently written. They hired, you know, they, the Atomic Energy Commission in the United States, they hired like the best historians and they gave them free range and the histories are gorgeous. And you read these histories of these armed control agreements and they were just, I mean, I'm not saying they were never sincere, but it was like they would, they would try and, and both sides were just like, no, they didn't really want to do it. Okay, so then the bombs, so... 
Okay, so we get through the Cold War. The bomb spreads. After the Cold War, all of the anti-nuclear weapons people go, well, okay, we might have survived that. But that's because the United States and Soviet Union were basically civilized. Once the bomb gets to India and Pakistan, those people are in uncivilized and they're going to bomb each other if they go to war. No, it works the same way. So you, I mean, you might have missed it. Pakistan and India had a war last year, you know, or was it? Yeah, last year. Um, what does it consist of? Uh, some elements of the Pakistani military. They kill some Indians, you know, police officers and soldiers. The Indians scramble some MiGs and they bomb a terrorist camp on the other side. The Pakistanis are like, it wasn't really a terrorist camp. But the Indians are like, yay, we destroyed a terrorist camp. And both sides, on both sides, the Hindus and Muslims are like, go kill those other guys and go war. Let's go to war. And the generals are like, yeah, absolutely. We're going to have this amazing war. It's going to be great. And the generals are like, oh, hell no. Like privately, they're like, no, <laughs> like not escalating. Because they have the bomb. That's why they didn't go to war with each other. And everybody knows that. All the experts talk about it. It's clear as day. They have a fancy concept called deterrence. This is like gravity in international relations, deterrence. Okay, maybe that's just another coincidence. Well, India and China had a war this year. Same thing. You know, so... So, so deterrence works until, until it doesn't. Um, I, yeah, I think... I mean, I but let's say it doesn't. Let's say it doesn't. Let's say it doesn't. Let's say somebody fires, in, let's say India or Pakistan fire a nuclear war, at a nuclear bomb at each other. Why do we think that's going to escalate? I mean, I think, I mean, if you interview Vipin Narong, who's now, he's the, you know, the nuclear weapons expert du jour at MIT, um, smart guy, interview him. I go, what, what happens if India or Pakistan uses a bomb at each other? He's like, he's like, I think everybody just freezes. The international community just rushes in. They're just like, what do you do? You know, this picture that people had that somebody fires a nuclear weapon at each other and then everybody's suddenly firing nuclear weapons at each other. It never made any sense. Um, so maybe, maybe, maybe people will turn out to be rational in a situation like that. And uh, that everybody will be so f horrified after the first weapon is fired uh, yeah. that that will be the end of it. Maybe that's what would have happened in 1985 or maybe not. I mean, the inconsistency. I see, and your overall worldview, is, I see you as this, again, a very optimistic, can-do person. You look out there, you see problems, and you think they're solvable. You don't succumb to uh, despair or paralyzing fear. And I, it's, it's actually puzzling to me why um, you would be so fatalistic, and that's how I see your position on nuclear weapons, fatalistic about getting rid of nuclear weapons which to me are this, this uh, you know, it's just a disaster waiting to happen just because it hasn't happened so far and just because there are these plausible scenarios that you just spell out where it never escalates even after there is an initial exchange doesn't mean it's going to happen in the first place. And by the yeah. way, I, I think that getting rid of nukes has to be, you know, and this is the, one of the themes of my book, The End of War, within the context of a demilitarization worldwide that the nations of the world will recognize that this is an enormous waste of our resources you know especially with the united states we spend these astronomical amounts of money on uh, and, and also invest all this energy in uh weapons arms armies and all that um i just wish you know i've been pushing this on you for quite a while now on on you and and ted um why not somehow really go back to your progressive roots and make anti-militarism and anti-war part of your overall picture of- uh, I am anti-war. But, but if, you're, I mean, if you're not, so- No, no, let me, can I just, let me just, by the way, just, okay. just I'm from, a men, by the way, I'm from a, the Mennonite tradition, conscientious objector, pacifist. I'm not a pacifist anymore. However, I'm anti-war. That's why I think, I mean, that's why I look at these nuclear weapons and I go, the death toll from natural, the death toll from wars and battles has declined precipitously since World War II. We're in the long peace, right? And even, even opponents of nuclear weapons recognize long peace had something to do with nuclear deterrence. So I'm actually, by the way, I'm not an optimist on this issue. I'm actually, I think there's something both it's a paradox. I think there's something both 
kind of horrifying and beautiful, which is that, look, we're these highly evolved primates, okay? And there is just this history of just horrible wars and murders and just terrible retribution and it's just irrational, whatever. It got to the point where our weapons became so powerful that it became mutually assured destruction. I mean, you can kind of go World War II was close to that, although the United States was obviously almost invulnerable because of our geographic location. As soon as nuclear weapons were invented, the United States was no longer invulnerable. And who reacts to it the most? It's the elites of the United States and to some extent the developed world who were people who were invulnerable to war. I mean, maybe the kids would go and be officers, but suddenly everybody's got skin in the game. The United States could go and invade countries around the world, you know, Iran, Guatemala, overthrow governments, do whatever the hell we wanted to do. Um, now, I think there's something else going on though, and I figured this out by talking to a close family member, I won't say who, <laughs> who hates, who's, whose view is exactly the same as yours. And she, I was describing all this to her, and I was just like, it just sounds like you don't like the fact that the way that we're achieving peace on earth is with a bomb. Because let's be honest, it's a technical fix. We're not achieving world peace with brotherly love and reason. We're achieving it with a bomb. And that's, I don't like that either. I wish it had occurred through some enlightened consciousness and brotherly love and negotiations and whatever, but it just didn't because we're just, terribly violent primates okay yeah. let's just be blunt about it but let me just finish the point okay um which is that um i think that that is driving a lot of the resentment against weapons it comes out of the mennonites it comes out of the quakers these are all my people i went to a quaker school there's a kind of hatred of nuclear weapons because we just can't stand the idea that that's what is behind our peace but I would just sort of suggest, I would kind of go, look at our history, man. I mean, um, and, and, and it, when you look at, when you really read the histories of how hard they tried, I mean, look, even Eisenhower, you know, who gets a really hard time because he built so many weapons. I mean, so many. Um, they wanted to get rid of the bomb. They really did. Kennedy really wanted to get rid of it. Carter really wanted to get rid of it. Reagan wanted to get rid of them. It wasn't for lack of trying. It wasn't for lack of the public wanting it. Everybody wants to get rid of weapons. It would be great if we could get rid of it. But as soon as you look at it, you just kind of go, that everybody looks at it and they go, that actually doesn't, doesn't seem like that's going to work. And so I think you kind of have to get to a point. Like at what point, John, I guess the question for you is, at what point would you say nuclear weapons are here to stay? Is it 50 years? Is it 75 years? Is it 100 years? Is it at ever? No point. At no point. I would never say that. Because I, I, I think that they, as I said, they're, they're a disaster waiting to happen. I see them as the, uh, the kind of absurd culmination of our aggression and of our militaristic culture. I don't think nuclear weapons have had anything to do with the peace in Western Europe since World War II. It's inconceivable, now, it's inconceivable now that France and Germany would fight each other. That's not because they both had nuclear weapons. It's inconceivable now that the United States or Canada would get into a war. Some of this- What about North Korea, John? What about North Korea? Yeah, I know there are hot spots around the world, but I no, think- No, no, I know, but is the world better off with North Korea? In other words, North Korea has the bomb. Are North Koreans more or less likely to be attacked by the United States now? Because they have, because they have the bomb. I mean, John, is is North Korea? I mean, is the United States going to invade North Korea now? Uh, no, but the United States isn't going to invade Iran either, and Iran doesn't have the bomb. I mean, I mean, these are complicated situations. I'm just hoping that the overall trend in civilization is toward, especially at the level of nation states, is toward yeah. less reliance on on force or the threat of force. Uh, and more on diplomacy and, um, you know, mutually beneficial relationships, um, economic uh, interaction yeah. and all that. John, you know, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. If Iraq had actually had the bomb yeah. in 2001, would the United States have invaded? Uh, 
I, I'm not sure what I, I don't know what your point is, Mike. No, I think you know exactly what my point is. If so Iraq had had the bomb in 2001, the United States would not have invaded. Full stop. No, we. If the United, if the Iraq had bom- had the bomb and the capability of delivering it and landing it at Tel Aviv, Paris, Berlin, London, New York, or San Francisco, we would simply not have invaded Iraq. Full stop. And you know it's true. Well, first of all, I don't think Israel or the United States would have let them obtain the bomb in the first place. Uh, There are certain places that are where, yeah, maybe war did not happen because one side or the other possessed nuclear weapons, but that to me is not an argument for not getting rid of nuclear weapons ever. They, they still, you know, there's this like powder keg under the world that could explode at any point. I still see nuclear weapons in that very old fashioned kind of 60s way because I think it's true. And I think that we need to get rid of nuclear weapons as part of this overall program of demilitarizing and then taking all those resources that we spend on, on weapons and, uh, and armies on all these other problems that we have. War is just this ridiculously primitive, regressive, stupid, immoral behavior. But listen, I didn't want to end up talking about that. I agree. But first of all, just let me say, like, I agree. And by the way, the whole point of nuclear weapons, that was in in Eisenhower's buildup of nuclear weapons, was so that we didn't have to have large standing armies in Europe. And that's what occurred. Suddenly there's big bombs pointed at Russia. I mean, there's, I, I know what you're, I agree with what you're saying in that there's something tragic and sad that this is how peace on earth, this is how we got peace on earth. And maybe there will be some day in which that's not the case. I don't, I, I don't know what it is, but that is the case now. And there's no, like, I mean, honestly, I kind of go, North Korea is not going to be invaded by the United States. Did we let North Korea get the bomb? No, we're not. We didn't let we're not letting Iran get the bomb, but Iran may get the bomb. Um, I mean, look, when you when you when you ask Dick Rhodes, you go, what do you think will happen if Iran gets the bomb? He doesn't say it's going to result in nuclear war. He says it's going to result in peace in the Middle East. Now, you may not like the way they got peace in the Middle East. But I think it's worth acknowledging that that's how they that's how they would get it. That's how I mean, Israel gets the bomb. Israel was not stupid to get a bomb. I mean, come on. They got a bomb in 68. The French helped them. I don't think Israel, I mean, it's sort of sad. I get your point, but I just don't think it's, I don't think it makes sense to suggest that, that, that Israel was being irrational to get the bomb. Israel guaranteed its survival with the bomb. Yeah. You know, is France, France got the bomb. The United States tried to stop France from getting the bomb. France got the bomb because it didn't want to be invaded by Germany anymore. Do right. we really think it was wrong that France got the bomb? France is now going to be the leader of Europe because Germany hates itself and wants to wants to dissolve itself into the EU. And France is going to be end up being the leader of Europe because it's the one that's got the bomb. I don't think, you know, I mean, that it's, yeah, I get it. It's kind of too bad, but that's just the kind of animals we are. I mean, I'm more of a, I think I'm more of a Hobbesian in, in that sense. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's something about us that's pretty violent. Yeah. I, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm still, Hopeful, maybe irrationally so, but uh, when I look in the future, um, I think one way or another, it's going to take some kind of imaginative, ambitious leader who realizes this is, uh, you know, that an anti-war platform could be. You had it with Obama. You had it with Obama. Obama was amazing. And it didn't happen. Nobody had done more. Yeah. I mean, look, Reagan and Reagan and Gorbachev sat down in Reykjavik. And tried to do it. And the, now all the stuff that comes out, I mean, you know, Schultz really wanted it, you know, and, and Obama wanted it. And at the end of Obama's time in office, his nuclear policy really wasn't that different from Trump's. It's never, you know, you know the last piece I wrote for Scientific American was uh, the title Defund the Military too, or Defund the Pentagon too. And it, it just, the amount of money that we spend on armaments has never seemed stupider than right now when we're struggling with a real threat to our safety, this, you know, this, this terrible pandemic. And meanwhile, climate change is still happening. We still do have these environmental problems. We've got, um, we've got terrible inequality and poverty in this country and around the world. And we're spending $750 billion a year on, on, uh, on our military. I, by the way, I agree. 
you, by the way. Um, can you hear me still? Because I'm taking my my yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, um, so first of all, the big cost of the military is is the people. You know, nuclear weapons are not actually, they look like a big cost when you add it all up over 10 years or whatever, but that's not a big cost. The big cost is the people. And I agree. The American, we should never have had an empire. We, I mean, my view is if North Korea can have the bomb, and let's just be honest, they're not going to get rid of the bomb, okay? If North Korea can have the bomb, I don't understand why Japan and South Korea can't have some nuclear armed subs to protect themselves. I don't know why the United States has to maintain this massive military presence at Okinawa. They don't want us there. There's occasional rapes that occur. It's very controversial. Well, when you ask people, why do we have to have this presence still in Japan? They go, well, you know, we've got to have this military force capable of whatever. We're not even using it. We're letting the Chinese take over the South China Sea. You know, they're making islands in a military basis. So as long as the world is reverting back to nationalism, I don't see why our allies in Asia, why don't, I, don't, I don't think most Americans even know that we are on the hook if Japan and China get into it. Somehow me and San Francisco and my kids and whatever, we're all vulnerable of nuclear attack. Why? So because we want, don't want... You want more nuclear weapons... You want more nations to have nuclear weapons. You think that will make for a safer world. My view is I'm with Kenneth Waltz, who is the founder of international relations, a progressive, a liberal. And he points out that, first of all, this word proliferation, which means rapid spread, has never been the case. It's always been a slow spread. There's nine countries that have nuclear weapons today. I don't see, I don't, first of all, I don't think Spain or Portugal needs the bomb. I don't think Philippines needs the bomb, but Japan and South Korea, advanced technological countries. I mean, Japan is like two or three months, or I mean, I don't know, four weeks away, six weeks away from having a bomb. You know, when you go to Japan and you go to a nuclear conference, they're always like, we'd like to give you an update on all the plutonium we have. And we'd also like to remind you that we have really good rocket and satellite capability. And you're always like, why are they talking about, you know, Japan? It's called latency. Um, You know, I mean, Dick Rhodes and I are pretty close. I mean, I think Dick would like to see countries be more at latency where they're not fully armed and ready to go. There's a bunch of reasons why that is hard to do. But, yeah, I mean, I kind of go Japan, Germany, South Korea – I don't see why they shouldn't have nuclear weapons to protect themselves. And then they can provide the nuclear umbrella to Europe and Asia. I don't see why the United States needs to provide a global nuclear umbrella. That strikes me as far more dangerous. God, that, that would. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to let this one, this one go. Um, But that's, that's really, that's really interesting. That, that, yeah, that's, uh, it's uh, by the way, it's not a fringe idea, by the way. I mean, it's openly possible. I know I've got, there's a um, there's a real uh, legitimate nuclear expert at my school, Alex Wallerstein. He's a young historian of uh, everything nuclear, and um, I am not sure if he would go as far as you you do, but he he also thinks that uh, eradication of nuclear weapons isn't wise, and that there actually is some merit to the argument that nuclear weapons have made the world safer over the last seventy years or so. But I, I just wanted to wrap up by talking uh, about uh, capitalism. Yes. Um, I mean, and I going back to nuclear uh, energy, it seems to me if, you know, so you've, you, you know, I brought up the question of market forces really not, or Wall Street not being behind nuclear energy right now, at least in this country. And, you, you know, you talked about some of the countries that have really succeeded with nuclear weapons, I mean, nuclear energy with uh, state-run programs like France and Sweden and so forth. Um, are you suggesting, and, and if you were like energy czar under Joe Biden or something, um, would you try to create a government run revival of nuclear plants? Do you think that that's called for at this point? Yeah. I mean, I think the most, so, so um, here, here's what I, what I think about nuclear is that, we will, and by the way, I think he'll maybe actually go even climate change. <laughs> I think what will determine how warm the planet gets is how much more nuclear power we do. Pretty much full stop. I mean, I'm, 
yeah, there's natural processes and we don't know what the climate sensitivity is, blah, blah, blah. But just the switch from coal to natural gas is happening without any kind of political intervention or whatever. In other words, everybody would rather have natural gas than coal. And the natural gas industry is perfectly capable of defending itself, whatever. Nuclear is special and different because people are afraid of it and they displace their anxieties about nuclear weapons onto power plants. That's why I advocate for nuclear. That's why I'm passionate about it and emphatic and allow myself to be framed as some kind of a fanatic and whatever. Um, that's what, so for me, you know, if you want to be closer to two degrees rather than four degrees, just do more nuclear. So that's okay. That's the thing. Um, should there be a big government program? What matters is public opinion. That's it. I mean, utilities, even pri private utilities are basically like government entities. If you, when you meet people that are the executives in utilities, and I've met a fair number of them at this point, they're like government bureaucrats. No disrespect if they're watching. Um, nice people, but these are highly conservative people. They're very concerned about public opinion because they have to serve everybody. The electric utility has to run 100% people. So if like if 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 only 40% of people, which is about the number in the United States right now, want nuclear power, you as a utility you can't do nuclear power, right? It, and it doesn't matter. I mean, basically the private utilities and the public utilities are just as wimpy on 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 nuclear power. Even when the executives are like, you know, you'll often meet these executives that are like, hey, we know nuclear power is the best, but the public's afraid of it. So, and I understand that. I get that. That's why I do what I do. I'm trying to change that to nuclear power. So it's more like if I were Biden or if I were, you know, a politician or something, I would just spend some time trying to get the public on board. You know, um, I actually ran for governor of California. I don't know if you know that. I did know that. <laughs> um, yeah. But when I ran, I said, what I said is I said, we'll have, I said, because I'm an advocate and that's, I'm biased. So I said, if I'm elected, which is kind of funny um, already, um, but if I'm elected, I would do a citizen's jury. They did this in South Korea. It's basically like deliberative polling. You know, you get a bunch of people together for several weeks, not all at the same time, but over a period of time and they get educated and they hear pro and con and neutral voices and whatever and if at the end of that period, the people of California want to keep our nuclear plants running, then we should keep them running. And if they don't, then we should shut them down. Because at the end of the day, I'm a Demo uh, I am a capital D Democrat, but a lower D Democrat. So that's it. And if I were Joe Biden or the Secretary of Energy, which, by the way, is not a job I want, um, I would just spend that time trying to educate people about the technology and trying to deal with our psychological hangups. Because I think that's what it basically is. I think some people... Once you become conscious of it, because it's tricky, because nuclear weapons, by the way, and you, I hope you understand what I'm saying. I think nuclear weapons are terrifying. Like, of course they're terrifying. If that's how they work, that's what deterrence means, right? Like, if they weren't terrifying, then they wouldn't work so well. Um, but I think then it's harder for people to go, wait, so you're saying that nuclear weapons are terrifying, but nuclear power plants are the safest way to make electricity, and you go, yeah. And then people are like, well, how does that work? And then you can explain it and whatever. But that's what I think matters. That, that's interesting. Well, so you sort of sidestepped the issue that I was going to bring up, which is that I, I thought you were kind of like a free market guy. Um, well, that you think that the, the market can provide us with solutions and we don't need to turn to government necessarily to force certain solutions on people when they don't necessarily want them. But, you know, well, you you were just describing a very democratic process. So yeah. if you can't convince the people that nuclear energy is a good thing, right. then it's not going to happen. And I guess my question is, what then? If, if nuclear is taken out of your sort of prescription for the future, what should we then do? We're gonna, then we're going to – then the world's going to get a lot warmer. Okay. You think it's – And the world's going to get a lot warmer. But let me say something about capitalism, by the way. Let me say something about capitalism. First of all, capitalism is a concept that was invented by Marx. I don't think we've ever had a capitalist system. We have a mixed economy. Um, in other words, look, a third of our utilities are privately owned. I mean, I'm sorry, are publicly owned. Um, you know, a huge percentage of the population, oh my gosh, I don't know, what is it, 30, 40% has government health care. Right. I favor the Canadian healthcare system, 
right? And I mean, I don't know if that's because I'm whatever. I just, it just seems more efficient, less paperwork for one, right? So I favor the Canadian system. Are the Canadian socialists? Nah. You know, retail, that's a capitalist industry, man. Um, oil and gas, capitalist industry. Nuclear, yeah, it's got a bit of both. I mean, it is really tied to the government and always will be. The government also helped invent fracking, right? And it's, so I'm not crazy about this thing where we go, there's the socialist system and capitalists. It's usually some mix. I mean, even in the communist systems, I think they allowed some amount of free market retail. Um, and I think that's why I'm also, I'm more of, a, I think of myself as a physical, I'm very interested in, I'm, you know, Jesse Ossible has a big influence on me. He's in the book. And this is my criticism of my conservative friends is that they would sort of say they would reinforce the idea that there's some trade off between economic growth and the environment. I show all the ways in which economic growth has been good for the environment, but they would kind of go, well, we just got to let the market decide. But there's a lot of situations where the market can't decide because it's an, the electric utilities are the, you know, the classic example. It's, it's a highly, it has to be publicly regulated. There's no, no one wants five electric utilities stringing up electrical wires. So we have to make some decisions as a society. And those public decisions are by definition, socialist decisions. That's now in the book. Yeah. Sorry. That's very sensible. I, well, I, um, I've got to wrap this up uh, yep. because my roommate is, uh, I can hear her coming in the door. So let me just ask you uh, uh, the green new deal. Um, just what's, what's your, what's your opinion on that? Yeah. I mean, um, so first of all, unemployment is now like 11% and hopefully that'll come back, but I don't have a, a priori problem with government creating jobs or government stimulus. I'm, I tend to favor Keynesian monetary policy. Um, I thought the new, the first new deal was pretty great. Um, I think a green nuclear deal is a good idea. My problem is with renewables. So there's a physical problem with renewables. Solar and wind farms take three to 400 times more land than a natural gas or a nuclear plant. Renewables could not have led to the industrial revolution. They just don't produce enough energy. So my view is that there's a physical problem with renewables, the big environmental impacts. Michael Moore's movie, he had this movie criticizing renewables. He would lead you to believe that the problem with renewables was somehow that of capitalism. But that's crazy because solar farms and wind farms require as much land in a socialist system as they do in a capitalist system. So for me, if AOC, as a socialist, was like, we want to do the French nuclear build-out, sign me up. That's the difference. The difference isn't the government part, it's the technology part. The Green New Deal, if if it includes nuclear energy, then you're, you're all for it. Yeah. I mean, my view at this point is just, you know, people are like, Michael, are you for or against natural gas? I'm for natural gas when it replaces coal. I'm against natural gas when it replaces nuclear. At the end of the day, I think we're, we are going to be hundred percent nuclear at some point. I don't know if it's 2100 or 2200, but I just think it's such a superior energy technology that it's inevitable. Um, and, the, and yeah, the sooner AOC changes her mind on nuclear, the sooner <laughs> we'll have nuclear because she's so popular. Yeah. Um, all right, Mike, I guess that's, uh, we've got to wrap it up now. So thank you, John. Uh, thanks. Always a pleasure. Really, yeah, really. And right now, I'm going to have to, you, you sort of rock me on my heels a little bit. I'm going to have to go back and, uh, and uh, think a little bit harder about a, a, a nuclear bomb free world and how that might happen. Uh, but thanks just for being so. Thank you, John. It's always good to catch up with you. And I, um, you know, look, man, um, I'm still proud of that Green Book Award. That's not a small thing. I'm still proud of it. I brag about it all the time. I put it on my Twitter bio. That's good. I'm glad. I'm, I'm uh, proud. Well, of it. So uh, I hope you are. You still giving them out? No, no. I think uh, I think maybe three years, and then I, I had a donor who put up all the money, and um, and then I think he lost his job, and so uh, oh. so I. I didn't have the money to, to give that yeah. award out anymore. So I think it only lasted for three years. Yeah. But I was happy that uh, gave me a chance to meet you and Ted. Yeah, yeah. Same here, John. All right. 
Thanks again, John. All, all the best, Mike.